Any analysis of the gene stealer cult would not be complete without looking at their allies, the Brood Brothers. Brood Brothers are not hybrids themselves. They're the parents or siblings of hybrids or people who have been hypnotized to join the cult. But just because they don't share the genetic lineage of the patriarch doesn't mean they're any less loyal to the cause. In game, the gene stealer cult can't have imperial agents because we're not using an army where every single unit has the imperial keyword, unless we pull some shenanigans. But we don't need agents anyway. You don't want a Vindicare assassin. We already have two Vindicare assassins at home. Welcome to the hive cult. Let's focus hard on getting that 25% of our forces to be brood brothers. Let's look at one of the best units to include. We can't have epic heroes as brood brothers, so we'll be skipping over them. I swear I haven't seen this guy before. But we don't need him. So no epic heroes, no commissars, no ogrins, no ratlings, no regimental support staff, no aircraft, no tempestus skions. But we can have the very similar Kazakin as an elite guard of sorts for the patriarch. The brood father, the messiah, the one- Okay, let's not get carried away too early on. So this will be a detailed look at the Imperial Guard units so that the Astra Militarum players can understand how their units work in 10th edition of Warhammer 40,000. And Gene Steel Occult players can see a lot of good units that are available to them as Brood Brothers. And it is from this point of view that I'll be looking. So I won't be analyzing the orders of the Voice of Command because they're only available to your faction if you're Astra Militarum. And as a good disciple of the Star Children, your faction is Gene Steel Occults. This also means I won't be analyzing the Combined Regiment Detachment Born soldiers, the associated stratagems and enhancements, again, they are locked to the faction if you are Astra Militarum. Sorry guard players, but today we're just looking at the raw power. But that doesn't mean there is no synergy, just that generally, the Gene Stealer cult have their own way of sending wave after wave of troops at the enemy. What are some of the best and most thematic units to add to the cult? Infantry. Infantry squads can hold objectives, the infantry squads get the benefit of cover while they're there, they can provide a las cannon or a mortar, but there are better units to choose. Cadians and Kriegsmen. Now you seem surprised. We can now take these units. We couldn't in 9th edition, so if you had discounted them, look again at the Brood Brothers rule. We can have Cadians and members of the Death Corps of Krieg. At a thousand points or less, I think Cadians are a must. At a thousand points, you have four or five objectives, far less troops, but a similar number of objectives to 2,000 points. So any unit with this sticky objective type rule is very valuable. Start a unit of 10 of them on your home objective, it becomes sticky. Then you can hold it with 10 neophytes to generate more command points. And if you really are scared of deep strike at that game size, also a clamorous, but really just the 10 neophytes. Even if they're all shot to death by deep strike or outflank or indirect fire, it is still your objective because the Cadian Brood Brothers have touched it. Then the Neophytes will come back as a blip, probably, and can hold that objective again, while the Cadians have moved on to touch another objective in the midboard. At 2,000 points, it is not as necessary to have the Cadians. We have enough bodies at 2,000 points between our Acolytes, Neophytes, Metamorphs, Vehicles, whatever you want, to hold those objectives. If you wanted to include a larger squad or really try and keep your 10 men alive, you could add a Psyker. I think it's better than the Gene Stealer Cult Magos. Rather than having a chance of turning off the enemy shooting, we get a 4 plus invulnerable save. As long as you don't roll a 1. Incidentally, I've rolled a 1 every time in a game when I've been trying to use them. But in theory, this works. And it will keep your Cadians alive longer to touch more objectives. So while the Gene Stealers and units of infiltrating aberrants using enhancements are tying up the enemy, these Cadians can go around touching all the objectives. Remember that Cadians are just people. They don't need to be sended from people from the planet of Cadia. Anyone trained in the Cadian style is also considered to be a Cadian, at least as far as game rules are concerned. You could have members of the Death Corps of Krieg if you want. With a Medipack, which they can now take, they have the regeneration ability. So very similar to Neophytes, but we have that, of course, on the Neophytes with their banner. And Neophytes can return as a full unit with Cult Ambush. You would be swapping mining lasers and seismic cannons for plasma guns and melter guns. A little cheaper than Neophytes. It's 130 for 20 Krieg or 180 for 20 Neophytes. And 20 is a very good number to have. The Death Corps of Krieg could add in a Marshal to give Feel No Pain. Or they could add in that Primaris Psyker. And when I'm saying Primaris Psyker, I mean this model. Not a Primaris Space Marine Psyker. 
unlike with the Battle Sisters where a 4 plus invulnerable save of an Imagifier is not great because you'll still suffer against AP 0 and AP minus 1, a 4 plus invulnerable save will always be an improvement to the save of the Krieg. Unfortunately it only works against shooting attacks and you need to not roll a 1. The Krieg can thematically suit the Gene Stealer cult, but when you're adding 20 Kriegers and a character, you're at the same points level as a neophyte blob. And while both units have the ability to regenerate models, the whole unit of neophytes can return on a 4 plus, or a 3 plus if it's one of the first two battle rounds. With no access to the Astra Militarum reinforcement stratagem, the Krieg blob just won't be coming back. So it's better to have the neophytes. The third special kind of infantry squad are the Katachans. They can scout. And so if you want a mechanized list that's all about scouting, where everything scouts, except for the rock grinder, because I didn't notice that the word transport that's hanging off the edge here is part of dedicated transport. And unlike all the other kinds of transport, usually the rock grinder isn't a dedicated transport, just a transport. So it uses all the same rules, except for this rule and like one other rule. So the rock grinder can't scout, but maybe you want a chimera with a bunch of muscular brood brothers scouting up to support your metamorphs in a truck, but the metamorphs are better. You can have more flamers with the metamorphs and then you can come back on a 5 plus or 4 plus if it's the first two battle rounds. The metamorphs also have a much better combat ability than the catachans and they can use all of the gene stealer cult stratagems. The catachans can't. So I think we have in our army enough scouting and deep striking and infiltrating already so we don't need any more from the brood brothers but if you want a unified army like that it could be thematic if you want a better unit that can scout and thematically fits the gene stealer cult as their kind of elite bodyguard of sorts kazakin kazakin can scout and so you can put them in a chimera that is a dedicated transport but if they had an officer then the Chimera couldn't scout because not every model in that unit has the scout ability. And as a Gene Stealer Cult player, you wouldn't want an officer because Brood Brothers can't use the voice of command ability. Besides, if I understand it right, and I have triple checked, Kazakin can be issued an order even if they don't have access to orders. Their unit rule lets them have an order to affect the unit until the start of your next command phase. They don't have the faction ability voice of command, but they can still use orders. So as Brood Brothers, they can still be using an order even though we as Gene Stealer Cult don't have access to Voice of Command. So which order is best? They are all good depending on what you need. If you scouted at the start and you want to get onto an objective to complete a secondary objective in the first turn, move, move, move. If you were in combat, fix bayonets. If your squad has two hotshot volley guns and two plasma guns and you are shooting like infantry, fire by rank then all of those weapons get an extra shot. Or if you have melter guns and grenade launchers because you're hunting vehicles and monsters, choose take aim for plus one ballistic skill. This is something that stacks with any plus one to hits that you may have, but we can't get better than hitting on a two. If you find that you are the only unit in an area and you need to hold an objective, get a three plus save with take cover. If you're holding an objective and you're below half strength or there's a horde of Gretchen approaching, duty and honor to have a better chance to pass battle shock and hold that objective against the oncoming horde. So hotshot volley guns plus plasma guns is one pairing, melter guns and grenade launchers is the other pairing because then you get strength 9. So lighter vehicles you're winning on a 4 plus, heavier vehicles regardless of what you use it's a 5 plus, but the melter gun has the armor penetration, the grenade launcher has the range and can be used against infantry as well. It's a maximum of 2 of each gun in the squad of 10. The melter mine is nice to use once per game, just if you have it use it as soon as you can. If you get charged, use it at the start of the fight phase because you are unlikely to survive against whatever's hitting you. Or if you would survive because you're being attacked by that horde of Gretchen, use it to free yourself up quicker and get back to proper fighting. Don't save it all in the hope that a vehicle will pass by. And I think that you are better off keeping a hotshot lasgun instead of swapping that for the mine. If you like the idea of Kazakin, but you don't want to use Kazakin, try the Legends Death Corps Grenadiers instead. They cost 10 points more, they can't use the volley gun, but they get the free grenade strat every turn, which will be better than the mine because you can use the grenades every turn and they do an average of three mortal wounds. The mine is doing two or four against a vehicle, but only once per game. So that covers our lack of heavy infantry that isn't an aberrant. Heavy infantry with guns, but we also would like some cheap heavy weapons so we can get a heavy weapons team. We need las cannons, auto cannons are good, but then they need to be out in the open where they can be shot back at. Mortar teams are popular because of indirect fire, but they work better with Imperial Guard because then the bone soldiers rule kicks in. With the mortars, you get your indirect fire and you can hold a home objective, probably alongside some neophytes. 
Still, they can get some great support with a sentinel. You don't replace any key words in the current 10th edition version of Brood Brothers. So things like Daring Recon on the Scout Sentinel will still work with the Brood Brothers in the Gene Stealer Cult. It needs units that have the Astra Militarum keyword in your army, and if you have a heavy weapon team, that is the Astra Militarum keyword. So Scout Sentinels can still help your mortars, and that is a nice cheap pairing. The Armored Sentinel is valuable and it's 70 points relatively cheap anti-tank. You can get a Hunter Killer Missile and a Laz Cannon on it, and that makes it even better at its job of killing monsters and vehicles. We need as much anti-tank as we can get outside of demo charges. If they get nerfed again, or go way up in points again, we need all of the alternative anti-tank we can get our three clawed hands on. And this is anti-tank at range. You can also have the Sentinel Power Lifter in Legends. That does provide some mortal wounds on the charge and three strength 10 attacks. But for an extra 20 points, you can have an Abominant with three strength 12 attacks. And if you don't mind Legends, for 50 points, that is cheaper than a heavy weapons team, you can have a heavy quad launcher team. It gives indirect fire and it pins the enemy, not reducing their movement, but making them minus one to hit. So even if you don't kill them and you're firing at something you can't really hurt, you can still hinder them, especially a unit that's putting out a lot of shots. You always hit on a four plus, even if you move, though it only has a move of four inches. It's a very good choice, and it has the same ability as the Griffin Mortar Carrier, but at half the price. And this too will work with the Scout Sentinel's ability. A Field Ordnance Battery would provide more of a punch, but it isn't so great at 120 points. You could have two Bombast Field Guns, but part of their utility is lost because the Rearm Reload Fire is not usable because we can't issue orders to them. The bigger boom comes in the form of the Basilisk. It is more survivable in the weapons team, doesn't need line of sight, and like mortars, benefits from the sentinels reroll of one and ignoring the hit penalty for indirect fire. The enemy will still get the benefit of cover as usual from indirect fire, but the minus two AP will help mitigate that. I do recommend the Basilisk, or its legend counterpart with no tracks for 25 points less. You probably weren't going to move the vehicle anyway. But with the tracks, it can move on to empty objectives, and as a vehicle rather than a fortification, it can keep doing its job of shooting massive strength eight blast shells even if the enemy are attacking it in close combat. With the profile of the Earthshaker Cannon, some of you may be tempted to try firing it at vehicles, but it does far better targeting heavy infantry. The Strength 8 and Damage 2 is perfect for killing Space Marines. Devastator Squads, Desolation Marines that have their own indirect fire need to be put down. Even some of the infantry with higher toughness like the Gravis Marines and the Death Guard Terminators. Those Death Guard no longer have an army rule to ignore movement penalties. So changing their movement from four inches to movement two inches with the Earthshake around ability will make them very sad, even if you don't kill any of them with the shot itself. This is such a valuable unit for the cult. The enemy will have some rapid response units that can get to our ambush markers or counterattack our weak deep striking units. This stops them to some degree. Your opponent may also have some big death block like 10 Deathwing Terminators or Necron Lich Guard or Eldar Wraith Guard. Keeping those units slow means that they can't respond while you hit other units on the other side of the board with your 10 Acolytes with demolition charges and your Neophytes firing a lot of shots. That way you'll be able to piecemeal kill off the other units in their army without having to deal with the scariest enemy unit. And that is very much on theme for the Gene Stealer Cult style of play. Including one Basilisk for every thousand points in your army is my recommendation. And we don't need to look at the tank commander orders for the Basilisk because we can't use them. And the tank commander wants to be speeding up into the fight, not hanging back while he's in a tank. We can't have officers and units with the commissar keyword, but we can have the death rider commissar as that doesn't have the Commissar keyword, just Death Rider Commissar. It probably should have the separate keyword Commissar, but we probably wouldn't want it anyway. We can't use its orders, and if you were plain Imperial Guard, the Death Rider Commander is better for providing a plain order instead of being limited as to which order. Plus, then the whole unit can infiltrate. In the Gene Stealer Cult, this could be another unit deploying alongside the Patriarch and the Gene Stealers, tying up dangerous enemies in turn one and stopping one of their flanks from shooting. The devastating wounds from the Death Rider Commander is only on his own lance and only when he charges. It's not an ability for the unit. This man is no Chaplain Cassius. But the Death Riders are very similar in profile and role to the Gene Stealers, but the Patriarch does give them all devastating wounds. The Gene Stealers cost a little bit more, but get an extra point of armor penetration and they hit on two plus rather than three plus and Gene Stealers can advance and charge. Plus, pure strain Gene Stealers can use all of the stratagems that the Death Riders can't. 
You just need the Gene Stealer Cult faction keyword. The Death Riders are able to provide 50 strength 4 attacks for 140 points, with 30 of their attacks getting plus 1 to wound if they charge from the Lance ability. But they are inferior to Rough Riders. They are the same points for a unit of 10. But the Rough Riders have versatility. The strength 4 attacks of the Death Riders will do well against hordes, but the Atalan Rough Riders can put out D6 strength 4 lance attacks, averaging 55 attacks for a unit of 10, but without the minus 1 AP. I am including the mounts attacks in that for simplicity. And that is if you don't go for the Gold Lance, which is strength 6, minus 2 AP, 2 damage. The Rough Riders can also go after vehicles and heavily armoured enemies, which the Death Riders can't. The Melt Tip is only one attack, but with Lance on the charge, they are wounding the biggest tanks on a 4+. Where is that for the Battle Sisters? The Gold Lance is also wounding any tank or monster with toughness less than 12 on a 4+. That's just because of its strength plus Lance. It doesn't have anti-vehicle anti-monster. And before the game, you don't need to choose if a model has a Melt Tip or a Frag Tip. They can change as they are needed. Death Riders are fixed in the role of either tying up the enemy or fighting hordes. Rough Riders can do either, plus attack vehicles. Would you want them in a Gene Stealer Cult army? Well, if you don't think that your world or colony would have bikes, they make a nice alternative to the Jackal bikes, and I can see the utility of quickly charging enemy vehicles or falling back from infantry and charging enemy vehicles with their Horse Masters skill. But for 140 points, we're approaching Lehman Rust tank level of points, and I don't think four Melter Lance attacks and a Gold Lance would do enough if they're only fielded in a squad of five. The Attilan Rough Riders are a maybe, down to personal preference. Maybe use the Death Rider models because their horses have claws and you could think of them as horse-born gene stealers ridden by Brood Brothers. That's thematic. Our other fast options include transports. Now the transports that we get from the Brood Brothers will have to have an Astra Militarum unit inside. You can't put neophytes in a Chimera. Now if we take the Torox Prime, which is painted for the Tempestus, and can have Tempestus units inside, but it doesn't have the Tempestus keyword, we can have it, but it will explode immediately as per the dedicated transport rules unless you put a unit inside. In this case, the only units could have go inside are characters that go by themselves. Not a great choice when you will want your characters in units to support them, if you're including Imperial Guard characters at all. The Tau Rocks, the regular Tau Rocks, could speed some Cadians onto an objective with its advance and disembark ability. The troops can then sticky that objective while the Tau Rocks blocks enemies from easily reaching the troops. And you get a twin auto cannon in the bargain for 65 points. When supporting a Gene Stealer Cult Mechanized Army, this is a better choice than a Chimera, because the Chimera special rule is all about using orders even while inside a transport, something that just doesn't benefit the Gene Stealer Cult. You could put your Kazakin inside the Torox, and then they won't be able to use the ability to give themselves an order. That works from reserves, because you can use abilities while in reserves, but it won't work while within a transport. They could scout, and then have the Torox advance and then get out in the first turn, that will get them well up the board to almost be within the enemy's deployment zone. And in some missions like Crusade games, you will be in the deployment zone. And the enemy won't be expecting a close range volley of AP-1 guns coming out of a Gene Stealer Cult army. The Tau Rox is worth considering, but let's look at bigger tanks. Now you could use the Hydra, because if we can't have aircraft, because there are none in our roster and we can't use the Brood Brothers aircraft, then no one can have aircraft. But really, no one is using them anyway. And I can't think of a unit with the fly keyword that comes up often enough that would warrant spending a lot of points to counter them. Can you? Maybe if your local meta has a powerful Drukari list with a lot of raiders, or there's an Eldar player still including a lot of fire prisms, they have the fly keyword, so that could warrant the Hydra as a great counter to them, wounding on a 2 plus because of anti-fly. You may not want it at all in your list, but it's important to know that it's here if needed. Now let's talk about a real tank. Ah, here we are, the Cyclops Demolition Vehicle. It's actually really small. The Cyclops Demolition Vehicle is a great way to round out an army with 25 points left. It shows that we don't need to wait for the Tyranid Spore Mines to come when we can make our own with basically the same rules. And this is very thematic for the insurgency rebels of the Gene Stealer Cult. Don't even risk a wave of cultists, just send in automated bombs, pilot them remotely, and because it's likely to blow up even when destroyed from a distance, its deadly demise activating on a 4+, plus instead of a 6+, plus, having it arrive from reserves to hit the enemy unit in the flank is a better idea. Let's think of the actual 
big tanks. The really big tanks. What if we want a big cannon to corpsify some Infernus Marines? A squad of 10 or two squads of 5 is very scary for the Gene Stealer cult and gives massive board denial to Deep Strike because of their auto hitting Overwatch. We can use the Basilisk, that has indirect fire and is a very good choice for anti Marines, but what if we want to go bigger? If you've ever looked at the Lehman Rust Nova Cannon before and laughed, say hello to its big sibling, the Hellhammer. Its gun has a decent range of 30 inches and 4d6 shots with blast. So that's giving you an average against a squad of 10, 16 shots. Eight of them will hit, roughly six of them will wound, and you'll kill three marines. Okay, it's not that amazing, but it's cool to roll that many dice. And it comes with a demolisher cannon too, so you don't even need to worry about having a Lehman Russ when one of the best guns is integrated right there and can kill another two marines or provide anti-tank firepower, and we do want anti-tank firepower, to start hitting enemy vehicles and monsters. The Baneblade itself used to cost too many points for a Broodbrothers list at 2,000 points, until the September points changes made it 480 points, just the right size to fit into a 2,000 point list. So we can have a Baneblade, and they are the most common model of Super Heavy to see in casual play. It has an up-modeled battle cannon with 3d6 shots, massive range, and strength 12 means it's wounding infantry like the Terminators it should be going for on a 2+, and that damage 3 will kill most Terminators. It also has the Rolling Fortress rule which means that you can use it to get the benefit of cover, but only on Astra Militarum Brood Brothers units, and at 2000 points you only have 20 points left for other Brood Brothers units, so its special rule is not going to be very useful to us, unless you're playing a 3000 point onslaught or apocalypse size game. So there may be a better big tank to use. And it really is fun to put a whopping great tank on the table and grin, knowing that in 10th edition you are very much supported to have big tanks. If you're having trouble with the enemy big tanks, like land raiders coming up with their cargo safe from your demo charges, then they spill out a bunch of terminators or something similarly nasty straight into your acolytes before they can use their once per game weapon, then have a shadow sword. This is the best chance you have of killing a land raider in one shot. You're wounding on twos and with minus five AP, it will not get a save. As soon as you get two of its damaged 12 shots through, that land raider is done. And with devastating wounds against vehicles and D3 plus one shots, odds are you will destroy it in one shot. The super heavy tanks are not as viable in tournaments right now because of their often prescriptive terrain being tightly packed, which makes moving the super heavy very predictable. But in casual games, this can be a lot of fun. Most armies, including Gene Stealer Cult, lack the power to destroy vehicles. This fixes the problem and at 440 points is the cheapest super heavy. It comes with all the usual turrets like two heavy bolters and two las cannons to help finish off that land raider, or damage a smaller vehicle, or start killing infantry. The Bane Sword and the Doom Hammer are also viable for destroying vehicles, but neither of them wound on a 2 plus with minus 5 AP. And the Bane Sword has a habit of blowing up enemies with deadly demise and hurting your own troops that were too close. The Rogal Dawn tank is just too expensive to fit into 1000 points because it costs 260 points, and we can only have a quarter of our points spent on Brood Brothers. But even at 2000 points, I prefer the Lehman Rust Demolisher and a Scout Sentinel to spot for the tank and the rest of the Brood Brothers in the army and be a distraction and scout and complete secondary objectives. That comes in at the same cost, 260 points. As for which Lehman Rust is best, now the Nova Cannon looks nice for the shots, probably more shots than the Executioner for the loss of only one AP, but it gets ignore cover. The Tank Commander is thematic for the Gene Stealer Cult. Shoot once on death. Go down hard for the Patriarch. Fight to the last breath, my brethren. Sorry, getting carried away again. But if you want to know which Lehman Ross to take as a Brood Brother or Imperial Guard player, this video raises them all up, their uses and abilities. My darlings and viewers, if you need help, your brothers can be there for you.